Yeah, it's always been like that. I don't know what his problem is with me. Um, <laughs> you know, he's, mate, the only time he's, yeah, he pushed me on the back again. Like, he's, that's the only time he's actually being physical with me is when my back's turned, so. House of Rugby Ireland, here on Joe, together with Guinness. Game changed. Hello and welcome along to House of Rugby Ireland here on Joe together with Guinness. I'm Emer Considine and I am joined today remotely by Ian Madigan. We are delighted to welcome onto the show today someone who has recently made their Ireland debut and managed to bag a try in that first appearance as well. Welcome back to the show, James Lowe. Cheers, thank you for having me. Delighted yeah. to have you on today. Ah, no, well, I'm excited, I'm excited. The last time we were in each other's presences, we were um, doing some commentary on air for that Rugby World <laughs> yes, Cup. Yes, Tonga and France, France yes. yes. Surprisingly close as well, if I can uh, recall off the it top of my head. It actually yeah. was, yeah, it was so, so early in the morning time, those matches were yeah. crazy. Yeah, but sure, look, uh, we survived and we're here now. Have you not um, <laughs> continued on with your broadcasting career so far? <laughs> no, nah, I've been a bit busy. Um, fortunately, um, yeah, it's been a hectic enough schedule, you know, with the whole rugby stuff c uh, kicking in. So, um, no, nah, be busy enough. And luckily for you, you've you managed to get that first cap with Ireland. Um, but unfortunately, you have a few needles at the moment. Yeah, um, no, obviously, hugely uh, awesome moment uh, being able to. Uh, make my international debut, but uh, yeah, at the moment I've got a few niggles I'm trying to get on top of, and um, hopefully not too long, too much longer on the sidelines. Yeah, absolutely. Before we get into that, we'll chat later about all things James Lowe. But before Lovely. we get into that, we'll chat about the Champions Cup and I suppose how the Irish provinces have been getting on. At the moment, it's half time in the Connacht game and they're losing to Racing. Munster play later on and hopefully they'll get a nice win against Harlequins. But Ian, bring us back to Friday night. You got a nice old try for yourself. However, you started off well, but it didn't finish yeah. as well as you wanted. Oh, it, was, it, was probably, it was probably the toughest game that I've played in, in the sense that like one that we should have won and we haven't come you know, come over the line on the right side of the scoreboard. You know, we had plenty of opportunities. Took some of them, didn't take some of them. And in fairness to Toulouse, um, any time that they had chances, they managed to come away with points and, and quite often it was tries. So it was it was a very disappointing result for us. You know, it's put us under pressure now, losing our first game at home, you know, with the new format of the competition. It, you know, means we probably have to win our next three in a row to, to qualify. But... Um, I think there was plenty of positives to take as well as a, as a, as a team. We realised that you know we're definitely good enough to be competing with these top sides in Europe, and and we know that on our day we can we can definitely beat them. But you know credit where credit's due. Toulouse were very good, and they took their opportunities. You know, in particular, Dupont and Colby. Like I've been having nightmares about them the last last couple of nights. They're just they're freakish athletes. Like I'm sure you, I know you've come up against Kobe before, James. How, how did you find him? Oh, Jesus, mate. He's a pocket rocket, isn't he? He's uh, yeah. he's electric, um, ball in hand. And, you know, even defensively, he's a courageous defender for, for such a small man. But um, chasing, chasing him around is no easy feat. I think I've, I only had to tackle him once over there in Toulouse. Um, and fortunately, I had, I think, Josh van der Fleer on my inside. So... Um, you know, it's always nice having someone doing the dirty work for you. Having the tackling robot on your inside, no <laughs> yeah. better man. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, that's your tactic for the future, is to yeah, have somebody on your inside. Put, put the right people around you, you know, someone's, someone's got to do the dirty work. So Absolutely. You were talking about DuPont there and that you had to yeah. go back through the archives to find yeah. mistakes that he made. Yeah, I was just talking earlier about uh, when we were playing France and the Six Nations and how far back we had to look to actually find DuPont doing doing things wrong and uh, when he was at cast I think he was still 19 and this is just after he did an ACL I think that was the last time we found him make a mistake so man that guy is that guy's freakish he's, he's so quick around the park he's so physical makes all the right decisions and puts people into holes into space so um, I mean he's a nine that's going to be around for a, for a long time and someone who's going to unfortunately be yeah, in my for, nightmares as well yeah for a small man he's actually incredibly strong you know you Obviously, every defensive coach is going to be saying, look, take his time away, get in his face, you know, put him under pressure. But his ability to kind of wriggle out of contact and get offloads away, you know, he's a nightmare. Like, we we actually had a plan when we were playing them in, in the quarterfinal of Europe last year. And we we saw when 
uh, in their restart receipt setup, we saw that he was kind of on his own in the middle of the pitch. So we said, look, right, we'll put a high drop kick up on him. We'll send, you know, our three best defenders after him and we'll catch him. And, you know, we might even be able to lift him up and carry him over their try line. We'll have a five meter scrum. So anyway, put the kick up and it's a good kick, pretty good chase. And he manages to set, step, sidestep all three of them and, you know, take off down the middle of the pitch. And you're just gone. This is our big plan here, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, look, there's there's some things in rugby that you just can't account for. And that natural ability that those two boys have is, is definitely one of them. And, you know, I think, as you said, you've just got to do your best to set up to have guys helping you out inside and outside every time they're on the ball. Absolutely. And Leinster had a pretty good win over Montpellier as well yesterday. You know, not the strongest Leinster team. Well, it is strong, but, you know, I think everyone expected their internationals to be back. And it's good to see other guys back to play and back to start there. Yeah. Um, you know, like it's still a very, very competitive Leinster team and those boys who um, aren't you know, usually in that starting lineup, you're talking your Jimmy O'Briens, Rhys Ruddock, Kieran Frawley. I mean, they've they've done a lot of the a lot of the groundwork over this Pro 14, and they've earned those earned that spot. And uh, you know, a lot of the internationals coming in, like they're going to have to play well to get those spots back. And the boys put in some shift. Um, it's not easy to go over to France. That's a that's a test in itself. So for them to go over there, put in a performance, come back with five points, and you know, boys stood up like. Um, a diluted Pro 14. Those boys have been playing very, very well. And to see the likes of Reese Ruddock put in an absolute shift, like everything he everything he touched is impact on the tackle, work around the breakdown. Um, you know, that new haircut has, do, has done him some favours because he's playing outstanding. <laughs> yeah. What do, you think, what do you think about it yourself? Yeah, no, I won't, I won't be shaving my head anytime soon. But mate, he's been he, a man of the match performance and uh, so thoroughly deserved as well, man. He's he's gone and he's kept in the side that had, you know, James Ryan, uh, Sexto until he, he unfortunately pulled out. You know, you've got so many leaders, Scott Fardy as well, um, so many leaders around, but he's taken that the ball by the horns and mate, he's he's playing outstanding. Yeah, Dan yeah. Levy's another one who's great to see back and in Champions Cup games yeah. as well. What was it like for like obviously you saw firsthand the the struggle he had to get back from the, what injury? Just the emotional roller coaster that he was going through, you know. He did everything absolutely possible you could in a knee to you know, if if he wasn't so young, you know, that's a career ender. That's a career ender for most people over thirty. So he, he had a lot of things on his side. He had awesome people, but just to see him go through that roller coaster of emotions, to miss out on the World Cup, um, you know, he's he's an absolute athlete. He's a freak. He's a freak in the gym. He is massive. He shifts a lot of weight, and to, it's you know we went with that. I think the five six two split on the bench, and you know he's that extra loose forward that you that you throw in there because he's. You can't leave him out, you know. There's so many good players, but it's awesome to see him back, man. I could babble on about him. He's a, he's an awesome bloke. So, um, mate, it's it's awesome to see him back. That's for sure. Yeah, he's he's one of those guys that just kind of has bulletproof confidence. You know, he no matter who he's coming up against, whether it's you know Saris, England, France, New Zealand, any of the top teams, he's just backing himself every day of the week. And I knew, and like obviously, it was a very bad injury. But if there was ever someone who would come back from it it would have been him because he's just so bullish about, you know, where he wants to go in kind of nearly every aspect of his life. And look, fair, fair play to him. He's stuck to it with his rehab for, what, 18 months. And from what I've seen of him, he looks, you know, just as good, if not better. And, um, you know, he, he's definitely someone who strikes fear into the opposition. You've, put, you've got to put a huge amount of work into preparing to come up against him because he's such a threat as a ball carrier and getting over the ball. So, no, look, it's great. I think between himself and Reese, like, you know, obviously I've had the pleasure of playing with Reese over, you know, during my time in Leinster and, and Ireland. And, you know, I definitely think he's someone who can add serious value into that Irish squad. It'd be great to see them two guys in, you know, even in a really competitive back row, you'd wonder where they'd fit in. But I suppose yeah. the competition is good. I mean, that's the same. I mean, when you look at the English back row as well, there's so many good players missing out. I mean, that's the same in Ireland. Um, I mean, the fact that those two, I mean, Leaf probably needs a bit more game time, a few more starts um, to really prove his point. But I mean, he's, I mean, he's done it before. You know, like you said, that bullish attitude. He's, I mean, if he scares, scares the opposition, he scares me in the changing room, man. He's such a big dude. Um, mate, those two, I mean, they're definitely putting their hands up for Six Nations duties. That's, that's a no-brainer, really.
Another one I've been really impressed with has been Kieran Frawley. He's a young guy who's moved from 10 into the 12 position and he's really growing in confidence and slotting into that 12 position. Like he's almost a second, playing as a second 10, which is which just creates a nightmare for defences. because yeah. and he, he's, he's actually, he's huge as well. He's such a big, like he's, his, his frame, he's, I mean, he's, he's taller than me and um, he's very, he's a bit slim. Like he's, he actually eats like a horse and just can't put weight on. Um, but he's like he's physical enough for a twelve, but has the ball ba ball playing capabilities of a ten. So mate, he's he's also a very good young lad that has a big future um, in Irish rugby. I think. Yeah, I'm glad to see it. Um, okay, we'll be right back with part two, where we'll chat to James Moore about his experiences with the Irish squad and looking forward to the Guinness Six Nations in the coming months ahead. House of Rugby Ireland here on Joe, together with Guinness game. Changed. We're going to start off part two with our Guinness House of Rugby Hall of Fame. Every week we ask our Twitter and our Facebook followers for their favourite moment and this week we asked them about their favourite moment of James Lowe since he arrived in Ireland. We got lots of responses as always but the winners this week came from Shane Gallagher. He said, the try against Munster at the RDS May 2019 in the last minute. Great handoff on Mike Haley and into the corner. He's done it a few times, but I loved that at the time. He seemed to be enjoying his time in green playing alongside the likes of Conway, CJ and Pete. They seemed to be enjoying playing with him too. I guess ultimately that's what counts to him. Keep up the good work, Seamus. So congrats, Shane, and welcome to the Guinness House of Rugby Hall of Fame. So James, in case you didn't know, Seamus is the Irish for James. So you'll have to go by Seamus Lowe at some stage. Yeah, perfect. No, I have been told that a fair few times. So. Very good. So he mentioned that try against Munster in 2019. As a proud Munster woman, I'm not quite happy when you score <laughs> tries against Munster in the, in the way you do quite often. But um, he said you seem to be enjoying your time in green. And I suppose, you know, it must have been a very proud moment initially getting the call up. You know, people had been chatting about it for a long time. You know, you'll be Irish eligible in a few years, a few months, and eventually the time came in the Autumn Nations Cup. Mm. And how was it? Yeah. Um, I was actually, when uh, Andy rang me the first time um, to head in for those, uh, the two weeks of the Six Nations, the end of the Six Nations, I, I hadn't qualified yet, but he rang me and he said, uh, Leo's happy for you to for you to come in and, and learn and absorb as much as you can. So I was actually at the driving range then, so I was like kind of whispering back to him. And I, I told him when I got in, I was like, sorry, I was at the driving range when I took that uh, <laughs> when I took that phone call. So um, no, it was it was awesome. You know, it was a bit of a a bit of a baptism of fire in, in a lot of ways. You know, um, and going into that environment, people were very welcoming. Um, it's funny, man, because you have all these pre like these. You imagine people from playing against them on the rugby field that they're going to be like these certain people. <laughs> uh, not very nice words, you know, uh, which I probably shouldn't say. But you, you know, once you once you take off the red jumper or a green jumper and Connick and a blue jumper in Leinster, man, we're all just normal people, normal normal blokes playing rugby. You know, and you get to know them on a personal level. You sit down with them at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you realise these people are actually they're actually really good dudes. So, um, you know, everything that happens on a rugby field between you know the likes of Leinster and Munster, I mean, it, it stays there. It absolutely stays there. So, camp was awesome. Yeah, it's it's nice to know that you do think of those things going in. But was there a time where like the ice was just broken and it was like, oh, I'm safe, I'm fine, I'm I'm okay here. Um, no, because, and I've got an, an example, because I, I was with Pete, uh, Pete was inside me and he was the loose forward and I was outside him, and three passes in a training he threw at my feet, and that was, afterwards he's like, kid, like, oh, I promise I'm not trying to do that to you, like throwing passes at my feet, and, and then I just realised he actually couldn't, he, he just couldn't pass from one way to the other, and then, um, you know, that was, that was the, that was the extent of Pete's you know, anger towards me was throwing a few passes at my feet. But apart from that, man, like it's, it's water under the bridge. But like, like I do say that it, it's going to be interesting when we do play Munster next to actually see if it was water under the bridge to see if they do actually, uh, they do like me. Yet. But um, sure, we'll see, see how we go when that, when that know, happens. But like you say, it's, it's what happens on the field should stay on the field. Yeah. And I'm glad that once you all come together as, as four provinces, that, yeah. it's, that it's one country at the end of the day. Yeah, I think the better friends you are with them off the pitch and you're playing for different teams, the more you kind of want to get a win over them. You know, if anything, you'll have, 
you'll have made that rivalry far worse now by getting to know them in camp. And um, I think that's one of the great things that we have in rugby, you know, that we can, you know, play together with our national team, but then go toe to toe in those interpros. So I think it's going to be very interesting now over Christmas. Um, obviously, you know, we've touched on it with the, the Guinness Pro 14 that it hasn't been particularly competitive, but all the Irish sides are well placed. So, you know, it should be really, really competitive come Christmas time. James, tell us about, I suppose, your first cap and playing against Wales, you know, proud moment. Strange not having your family and friends there, but still a proud moment all the same. Yeah. Um, you know, like when I, when I rang, my, rang my dad telling him that I was starting, he literally sent back, well, he's, you know, not too much through the phone, you know, he sent me back almost like a thumbs up over the phone. <laughs> That's sort of, sort of how it was. But then, um, you know, he sent me a message after that just saying how proud he was and, how awesome the family feels about it, and they were up first thing in the morning watching, um, and yeah, it was it was awesome, you know, like to be able to, you know, play at home um, to put in a performance against a very good Welsh team. I know they're going through a few problems of their own in terms of the coaching stuff, but I mean, there's still some highly experienced internationals. Their back three, you know, there's lines caps all throughout that as well. So for uh, for us to be able to perform against them was was awesome. You put your mark down fairly early against Liam Williams. You know, you got into it fairly Maybe. early and fairly fiery with him. Yeah, it's always been like that. I don't know what his problem is with me. Um, <laughs> you know, he's mate, the only time he's yeah he pushed me in the back again. Like he's that's the only time he's actually being physical with me is when my back's turned. So. Um, to be able, we actually had a set move and it was just fortunate it was on my side and then I had him in front of me, you know, you I could have gone left or right but I really wanted to go at him so, um, you know, that was, I mean, that's only a small battle within the whole greater scheme of things, you know, and, um, you know, that whole game, it's, it, it went by like that, you know, that's the unfortunate thing, you wish you could do it again but, um, to, you know, to also manage to get over the line was awesome, um, that scrum, went down so many times and I was actually in Caitlin's ear every single time I was like look like we're going to have a dime we're going to have a quick scrum here you're going to get it you're going to get outside the flankers 10's going to come at you and then please pass me the ball just please do it and the scrum kept going down and I kept nagging him he's like mate you just need to chill out like I'm going to do this like if that happens it happens so um, fortunately it did and to be able to get over the white line was awesome yeah. It's interesting to hear that because I think a lot of people said it looked like a planned move. From the way you set up behind the scrum, it was like Kayla yeah. knew he was passing you that ball. Yeah, yeah, right from the, like our scrum had gone down a few times. We were under a little bit of pressure. So it was a quick scrum, it was literally a quick hook straight to him. He was going to get out and beat the flankers. So um, it was a planned move and it was just fortunate. Like it was like the, that line out move it was just fortunate. It was on my side. Um, and then the scrum was fortunate it was there as well. So, mate, I was, I was stoked, you know, to be able to, to, to come off the pitch and have put in a shift that there's always, always what you want to achieve. With, um, with Liam Williams, obviously, he's a very competitive player, and kind of fiery player to come up against. You know, I, there is definitely similarities between yourself and himself in the sense that you're the kind of guy you'd, you'd rather have him playing in your team because he he's infuriates the opposition. Yeah. You know, he's willing it up in their in, in their face and you know he's, he never really shirks the you know the the contact side of it was there much verbals as well kind of on the pitch or <laughs> um i like i'm i'm open that i'm a bit of an instigator when it comes to a lot of things that happen on the pitch like i'll always poke the bear and um i mean i don't do much else apart from that i get a few carries and then i'll just poke the bear and pick up the forwards when they do a good scrum or something like that so verbal there's always oh, there's always a, like you, you know yourself mads like it, this it happens like um you just be careful with what you're saying you don't say too much because the unfortunate truth is that sometimes you win sometimes you lose sometimes you run over someone sometimes you get run over so um everyone's got it their sunny day so you take the good with the bad would that be something that like you would bring into every game? Like, would you try and do that with every opposition oh. or just someone that you've had a tough with before? Um, or? Pot potentially. Like, you, you're, like, I wouldn't be a hothead by any means, but, like, I'd, I'd always poke and prod and see if you can get a reaction. Once you get one reaction, like, it's almost like a chain effect, you know? If you can keep someone off the game, because the unfortunate... Well, I mean, the reality is I'm a winger and I stand out on my edge and... You know, bark, tell everyone else what they're doing right and wrong. So, um, you know, if I can get a wee win like that, it's always, yeah, it's always a good one. Yeah. 
Trudy, Coleman, Bowlegged, and Teddy arrived to the game in the back of a horse. No, no. See, this is this. <laughs> I would never, I would never have said that. See, there, there, to me, there's always a few lines, and I try and I try and stay, stay well and truly on the right side of them. That's that's actually a, a line Matty O'Connor used um, back when he was coaching coaching Leinster. He said, "That bloody scaffold it arrived into the game in the back of a horse." <laughs> He's uh, a good man, Matty. So, James, fast forward a week, and it's a completely different kettle of fish against England. Yeah, um, you know, obviously, obviously a whole different beast as well. Um, an English side that's playing playing very, very well, a big physical physical back uh, pack, and um, you know, we were we were there or thereabouts against them. We were knocking at the door for so so long, and um, mate, credit where credit's due, they defended they defended very, very well, and. Um, a couple of moments of brilliance from Johnny May, and I mean that's the fine the fine line of um, international rugby, you know. So, um, oh, absolutely heartbreaking to to not have come away with a win there, and a very very tough uh, tough place to win, even without fans. Like it's still very very daunting. Um, but you know, like that, I think it put us like it, it kind of said like we were there or thereabouts, but we still need to make improvements, which is. I mean, we're very open about it as well. I mean, we're so close. We've got all the personnel. We've got the right people in the right places. But, I mean, if you don't nail moments throughout a game, you know, line-out didn't, didn't function as well as what it needed to. I think we had three or four line-outs within there, 22, and we lost three of them. So, I mean, that there sets the tone in a way. And um, it's so unfortunate because the effort and the attitude was there. It was just – we were just off on the detail when, um, you know – one try from a kick, Chris Farrell also got held up over the line. You know, all, all of a sudden it turns 18-14. I mean, it's a completely different ball game. So, um, yeah, it's it's tough to take. But, you know, it's international rugby and we'll get another chance. Yeah. What was the backlash like after the game? Um, from who? <laughs> the media. I feel like the media have really hit hard on the yeah. Irish team and the Irish performances. And they're, it's it's them and us very much. Yeah, it's a man. It's a funny one. Like I don't I don't read too much of the media. Like I, I find like not and not everyone, but um, the people who will be writing the the rugby report will also, you know, be doing the football the week after and the tennis and then McGregor will fight and all of a sudden they're they're UFC experts as well, so I don't read too much into that. But I, I mean, the unfortunate truth is that we we lost. We didn't. We weren't as clinical as we sh- could have been. Um, but we're going to get another chance. And you know, I'm chomping at the bit to hopefully be in contention to to play against them again. Because I mean, man, like a couple. Oh, it's easy for me to say a couple missed lineouts. There was obviously a lot of other things that happened throughout that game, but. Um, you know, we nail a few more of them, apply pressure in their uh, in their 22, and make them make them have to defend there for longer periods of time. Um, it could have been a completely different ball game. I know, yeah. with still even England, they're just so clinical. Like even though you had them pinned in their yeah. 22, they okay. still managed to score. Yeah, like they, they still get stop it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like that's that's exactly it. And they don't play too much rugby, but the rugby that they do play, I mean, it's it's pretty to watch as hard as it is for me to say that like they don't play much they kick the ball a lot and they're very clinical it's they're physical they defend well like it's it's very basic it was very simple sounds very Mm. simple you know it's easy to say it's simple but um you know that's that's it that's how they're playing and that's how they're winning yeah 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 it's a very kind of suffocating way of of, you Mm. know playing against it's frustrating because you just feel like it's just ebbing away from you as the game goes on, but obviously you're you're kind of new new into the squad. You've been there for the last whatever seven or eight weeks and, and played a couple of times. But I think from se- the sound in your voice, you believe to for Ireland to get let's say back on par or or ahead of France and England. You don't think it's going to require drastic changes. You just feel like yeah. a few tweaks here. You know what are your what are your kind of thoughts on oh, that? Hundred percent, like. I mean, I think I think it'd be silly to say that we're well and truly off the pace compared to them anyway. Um, I mean, in that autumn nations, I, I'm open enough to say that France and England were the two best teams. They played they played the best rugby, and I mean, it was highly unfortunate that the French teams couldn't select their be- their their starting fifteen. But um, I mean, we're I mean, we were knocking at the door in Twickenham, and that's I mean, if a- anyone who say, says we weren't is wasn't wasn't watching the same game as I was playing and so 
I mean, it's, I mean, we're there or thereabouts. I think there's still another, we're in fourth gear potentially, you know, there's still, there's still another couple of gears uh, we can get to and it's something I'm excited to be a part of, you know, so um, Six Nations just around the corner, so hopefully we can, we can actually deliver on that. That's the big thing. Yeah, certainly. I think as well, key guys coming back in, like, you know, Tig has obviously been a big loss. Um, I know Andrew, Andrew's done really well, but, you know, you, you, it's very hard to cover quality player like Tig or even Gary, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's quite possible, but, you know, there'll be two two big additions coming back in for, for the Six Nations, and that could well be the difference. Yeah, huge. Like, Tig, Tig is the type of player, like, you don't see many props with his sort of skill set. And, I mean, Andrew is an amazing athlete, don't get me wrong, but Tig's footwork, his, um, he, he's a leader in his own right, you know. He's, he's not someone who talks too much uh, in terms of a rugby sense. He talks a heck of a lot in the changing room. But, um, but you know, he's a leader in his own way and how he plays. He's clinical, he's a lion, you know. It's unfortunate he wasn't there. Um, and Gary, I mean... Words can't describe, you know, the <laughs> the golden boy there. You know, he's 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 an awesome human on and off the field, and brings a level, a, such a level head for such a young a young man as well. I mean, he was he's, I think he's got that thirteen jersey sealed up, if you ask me. But um, I could be a bit biased as well. <laughs> I saw a quick yeah. fire round that he did with Sports Joe recently actually and he said it was, it was like who's the strongest who's the fastest who's the most dedicated and like who's the most banter he said you no <laughs> no, no 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 Gary jeepers um, no by, I, I'm the butt of most jokes that, <laughs> <laughs> like I don't, I'm not the joker I'm the one that the jokes have been played on so yeah he might be a bit confused so they're that. laughing at you yeah not with me with you. Yeah, that's the I, difference there one day one day <laughs> We've got one tough question here. What is your reaction when you hear Chris Ashton has called you too big, too heavy and too slow? Yeah, um, I answered this throughout the week, you know, like it's, I mean, it's, I didn't, I didn't hear the full context of everything. And I mean, I just, I'll stand up and say like that Johnny May try, I didn't think he was going to score that. And I know it's my role to get back there and stop it. So I've, I, I fully understand that. Um, but as someone who's still, a player and or you know he's still playing professional rugby um, who would probably have more of a player's perspective on things could probably have understood um, or worded it in a different way like I didn't see it and I didn't see what he said or hear what he said but um, you know to come from another player is a little bit I don't know for me it's a bit much but um, yeah. someone who probably yeah. understood like someone who actually understands the game and the context of the game and um, yeah I, I don't think it was very nice um, what I... with, um, with that like when it's coming from another player so like for example he he knows that in different defensive systems you could you could have been told look when the play goes down that left side don't yeah. be crossing over the centre line of the pitch you know you've got to be ready because England will go width to width again and if you're not there, you know, shoring things up. I'm not saying that was the system, but I'm just saying as a player, there's a lot of stuff going on. So for like, like even for us at the at the weekend there, um, bloody Colby put in a chip and I was a yard behind, end up tackling him, he slides off the line and scores. You know, you can look at that and say, oh, well, look, I should have been on my bike quicker, but I thought we were going to make a tackle. I thought, you know, the play yeah. was going to end up coming back down the opposite side. You know, so it, it is disappointing when you see um, you know, current players coming out and being critical about situations where there's a lot of moving parts. Um, you know, so mm. yeah, but sure, look, he's probably trying to step up and, and make a bit of a name for himself. But. Yeah, he's next on your list. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind him in front of me either. That's for sure. But um, yeah, like, I, I mean, it's easy. I mean, I, I took responsibility. Like, I should have been there and I should have stopped it. I was absolutely bollocks in fairness. But um, for, someone who's, <laughs> yeah, for someone who's also played international rugby, who would have a fair amount of understanding. Um, but, yeah, like I said, like, I didn't, I didn't hear it or see the context of how, how he was saying it. So, um, but, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't mind, wouldn't mind him in front of me every now and then yeah. so see how we go. I think to back up that point, I have, like, England is just a different, they're just a different warrior, like, from playing every other team and playing England, I've never been as wrecked or tired or, as you say yourself, bollocks as playing English games. Like when you're giving your RPEs at the end of the game, yeah. like when you've to, I'm sure your SNC makes you do it as well as us. And 
it's a 10, like it's a full on 10. It's always a 10. There's never a game easy against England. And we played them in Twickenham one year and we, that was the, it was the year that we like had no subs left over. We were broken. I've spoken about this before. And Claire Malloy like dragged me into the line. Like I was, and I was like, I can't, I can't go. And she was like, get in the fucking line. Like absolutely dragging me in there and like pushing me into position. I was like, I can't. And if someone had made a run down the field, like I wasn't getting there. Yeah. Do you know, so I completely get it. And I think people, it's easy to watch from a sideline. It's easy to watch from a TV screen. But when you are there, facing the beast that is England. It's a completely different yeah. story. And I, I actually have to take a step back now when I watch a bit of rugby and I, I like come out and I like just say things without thinking it from a player's perspective. I'll be like, why didn't he do this or something like that? But then you, you also don't understand what's going through uh, the individual's mind, what the obviously the game plan is, their structure, what, you know, there's so many different, like you said, moving parts and different, uh, different things going on within a game that it's easy, It's so easy to sit at home on the yeah. couch and absolutely blast people for what you think they should be doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it absolutely is. Well, James, it's time for the House of Rugby Challenge. So we asked you to pick three things, um, a piece of rugby memorabilia, a jersey you have swapped and held on to, and something non-rugby that you treasure. So we'll start off with the piece of rugby memorabilia and hopefully there's a really good story behind it. Um, unfor like, unfortunately, there's not... To like in in terms of my rugby memorabilia, sorry, like every first jersey is always is always huge. Um, you know, ever since like playing like club rugby back home in Nelson to uh, my first college, like uh, now, like that's my first jerseys mean so much to me. You know, and I've actually bought them all over over with me because I the sentimental uh, value that they have to me. Like they they mean the absolute world to me, eh? So any first jersey for me is always my most cherished uh, cherished piece. I'm, I'm sorry, there's no yeah. story or no, anything. No, well, each jersey has a reason and and it's a pathway of yeah, how you got story, here. Yeah, a story, you know, like it's yeah a pathway in so many ways. So that's all. Yeah, they're my that's my uh, memorabilia for sure. Um, what about a jersey that you've swapped and held on to? Um, <laughs> weirdly enough. Uh, I wouldn't say Munster jersey. Yeah, weirdly <laughs> enough, I, I do have a Munster jersey uh, from where we played uh, when I was playing for the Māori All Blacks. But my favourite, um, I've got Lee Halfpenny's uh, Lions jumper um, from when we played them in uh, in New Zealand uh, for the Māori All Blacks in Rotorua. So it was um, that there's probably my favourite one. Weird because it's, it's literally like doesn't cover my belly button, but. <laughs> Uh, mate, he's got me in his back pocket even. Like every time I run at him, he's, 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 he, he's in my nightmares, man. <laughs> um, that's a great story. I actually was in that place, can't say it the way you say it. Uh, Rotorua, Rot you yes. can say it, yeah. Like I had to throw out all my clothes because they just stunk so badly. Yeah. Like so yeah. sure that jersey probably still has the scent of the yeah, game yeah. and everything. Yes, no, it's an amazing one. There's actually a photo of, of, from that game at, out at Santry Clinic as well. So every time you go out there, you can see... Uh, you actually see Shawnee and uh, Connor Murray out there. So, um, hopefully you won't need to make too many more trips out to the Sanctuary no, Clinic. No, I hope not. Hopefully, yes. hopefully not. And what about something non-rugby that you treasure? Um, uh, non-rugby, jeepers. My whole life revolves around rugby. Um, but like, um, so in New Zealand, so there's a thing called a tonga, so like a greenstone. So I wear this yeah. one here everywhere. This is one that my sister gave me, I think, for my 21st. I've got a fair few. I got one when I was 16. Yeah, for making different teams. So it's called a tonga. It's a greenstone. Um, tonga means treasure in Māori. So um, that's something that I like. I'll wear it like whenever I don't. It's like literally like put on your socks, your undies, and I put on then I put on my necklace sort of thing. That's so I always have it on me. Um, it's probably the thing that I treasure the most. It's you know, a gift from my family as well. So it's always, it's, it's nice to, you know, in a way carry them around yeah. with me. So Do you even wear playing? No, that's the only time. Like any time I do exercise, that's when I take it off. Um, I've actually worn it out before to like warm ups and stuff. And I thought, oh crap, got to run back in and, <laughs> you know, hang it up on the, on the hook. But, um, but yeah, I'll always, always have it on. Mm. That's really nice. It yeah. must be hard now not being able to see your family, I suppose, for having such a moment like your first cap, but also there in the other side of the world where, you know, two weeks quarantine is compulsory at the moment. Yeah. It's very hard to get over there. Yeah. Um, oh, it's it's what oh, like I signed up for this though. You know, like this isn't, <laughs> and it, and it's not too hard to communicate with them. Um, you know, we'd be messaging. My sister's got a 
you know, a one-year-old, so she's up. She's a wee terror at the moment. She's up all, all hours of the night. So we, you know, we were messaging just before at two o'clock in the morning back home, and uh, you know, it's not it's not too hard. I, I ring my mum most days as well, so she's um, it's it's genuinely like she forgets that I rang. She's so excited, and then after a couple of minutes, she's like, "Oh, we've talked about everything <laughs> last night anyway." So um, no, it's, it, like it is. It sucks not being there, but you know, it's not it's not too bad. I talk to them a lot. James, thanks very much for coming on today and best of luck for the rest of the season. That's it for part two. We'll be back with more rugby chat in part three. House of Rugby Ireland, here on Joe, together with Guinness. Game changed. So welcome back to part three. Before we finish up, we do want to cover the recent reports and interviews that have come out regarding concussion in rugby. Earlier this week, we learned that former players such as Alex Popham, Michael Lippmann and 2003 World Cup winner Steve Thompson were planning to launch a legal action for negligence against, against World Rugby, the RFU and the WRU over the effects of concussion. Thompson gave a couple of interviews in which he stated that he had early onset dementia and as a result of his head injuries sustained playing the game and that he cannot remember any of England's World Cup win in Australia back in 2003. Ian, imagine to have such an event, like such an occasion like a rugby world cup and not even be able to remember it yeah it was it was very scary reading and i think hearing the background to it and you know the thought process behind it from you know the, the medical advice you've been getting that it was almost like the film had been taken out of the video recorder was how it was described you know it's 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 very scary and I think obviously we've seen it with the nfl um over the last probably 10 years you know the different movies coming out about cte and and you know the the big lawsuit that they've had over there so it is it's it is scary when you it's a, it's happening in our own game um one of the positives from it is that they're not just looking for you know a lawsuit and and, and financial um you know benefits from it they're they're looking at, at ways to improve the game going forward you know we're not going to suddenly stop playing rugby off the back of what's come out but there's there's definitely improvements to be made um in both the hia protocol and and um everything from you know the levels of contact in training to you know even how many games players are playing within a season yeah so what in relation to the hia protocols like what's your protocol with a concussion or with like contact in training would you do a lot of contact in training to minimize those concussion risks yeah, it, it's it's definitely decreased as as my years as, as a professional has gone on. You know, we're probably doing more pad work in training as opposed to body on body full contact. You know, they they talk about different levels within training. So level one would be just grab. You know, that it wouldn't be um, full contact. If someone gets two hands on you, you have to stop. Level two would be shoulders on. You have to stop the the players you know, dead, if you can run through it, you can, and, and it's play on. And, and then level three is, is full contact. You know, it's it's no holes barred and, and you, go, you go as hard as you can. And I, th I think it change, it varies as well from club to club. You know, obviously I've, I've had the pleasure of playing in four different clubs and um, the levels of contact in each of those clubs will, will be different within a training week. And I think coaches can be re reactionary you know off the back of a poor defensive or a poor physical performance during the week the following week could have far more physical contact to try and you know improve our defense or improve our, our our level of physicality and i think there probably has to be some consistency brought in around that area you know it can't be reactionary um every week to the, the performance you know at the end of the day bodies and, and brains have to recover you know you might necessarily have been concussed in a game at the weekend but you might have had a lot of contact contacts and your your body and your brain has to recover in the, in yeah. the week from game to game like if you think about it any even if you don't actually get a direct blow to the head like every time you get a contact your head is ricocheting backwards or if you're knocked to the ground there is whiplash of some sort in that tackle, so even if you don't feel yourself that you were diagnosed with a concussion, essentially, you are still getting minor blows throughout the game. And I think there was some stat done that in the, 2000, in the 1993 World Cup, the average tackles per game was like 50 something. And in the 2019 World Cup, the average tackles per game was 200 or over 200. So the amount of tackles, like that's an awful amount of hits. That's an awful amount of opportunities for your head and your brain, especially to will be under pressure 
Yeah, certainly. And, you know, we've, we've spoken on the show before about, like, I, I'm passionate about it because I'm I'm at the receiving end of a lot of it, is is, is the pre-latching going into contact. You know, I, I think I saw a tweet by Rory O'Connor there over the weekend, and it was two of the French players pre-latching. One of them was 120 kilos, and one of them was 140 kilos. And, you know, that's 260 kilos going down someone who might only be 80 or 90 kilos that's regardless of whether that impact is directly on the head it's a huge amount of force going through your body um and i think that's definitely something that they can look at now i know, I know there's a different side to it and we had nigel coming on and, and talking about defenders doubling up on the attacking player and that's you know just as much 2v1 um and I, i'll be honest i don't i don't know if i know the solution to that um you know, at the end of the day, it is a full contact sport. Yeah, I think like even ourselves in our defensive structure, we are taught one high, one low. Like if you don't do a two man tackle, you're penalised. Like you get the balls given away or you go back 10 or they, the other team get an advantage. But like we are taught in training, our defensive system is get out, fill 10, 20, 30. And after that, we're up in a straight line and it's two, it's two against one. And then obviously you need a pre latch because it's 2v1 and then it's, then now as a result you've got your two latches and your two defenders and it's two against two. The force in that yeah. contact is instantly so much further. The the knock back to the ground is so much further. The the hit is so much harder because you have, what, like 200 kg against 200 kg. It's a car crash. Yeah, yeah. No, certainly. And like, there has been really positive changes even in the last six months, you know, where referees are defending any direct shoulder contact to the head if there's a reasonable amount of force behind it it's now a red card if you know it's le less amount of force it's a yellow card and off the back of that you then get you know defensive coaches or, or ta tackling coaches um or skills coaches as such you do get them stepping up and and you'll, you'll spend all week um, if a team has lost the game off the back of a red card the week before because of bad tackle technique then you're going to spend the following week working on dropping your body height, making sure that shoulders aren't going into, you know, necks or chins or heads. Um, and how the game is officiated is is a large part of that. And I think I think even for the attacking player now, like we've seen a good few times a, a player leading with the elbow, you know, once the elbow comes away from the body and, and makes contact with the neck or the head. Um, because, you know, a lot of the concussions are from, you know, the, the, there is ones obviously from hitting players' hips, but a lot of them come from elbows straight on the head. It's a very, you know, strong part of the body. It's, you know, sharp. And if you get that on the side of the head, there's a good chance you, you could well be knocked out. And I think how referees officiate the game going forward, it's very hard, you know, at fast pace, but, you know, you've got the two touch judges there to help you out. You've got the TMO there. And I think that's something that, as players, we've got to be more welcoming to. There's got to be pauses in matches if if someone does lead with the arm or, or a shoulder comes in on the head, that there's going to be pauses. It needs to be slowed down. It needs to be looked at because, at the end of the day, player welfare has to be paramount. I think there's two sides to it there. There is obviously how it's refereed, but also there needs to be a look at it, the laws. And I suppose if the laws are there, they will be refereed well. And in the past... Few, since that World Cup in 2019, they've been really, really strict on high tackles, especially around the neck, thankfully. Um, obviously, Bundyaki was on the wrong side of that, but, you know, it, it was an example and it's and they've continued on with those laws. However, I think the World World Rugby brought it in and trialled it in, in France and some French clubs in the French Club League. Um, they trialled these new laws in relation to concussion and tackling. And... I think it was they must tackle below the knees. I think it was below the hips or knees and it had to be below there. Um, and it significantly reduced the amount of concussions. Like, is that something that they need to look at? Yeah, like there are there are studies like that done, but there's also a number of concussions that are unavoidable. So like when you have two defenders coming in, tackling an individual player and the two defending players yeah. meet on the opposite side and the heads collide, like some of the worst concussions I've seen have been players knocking themselves out, knocking themselves yeah. out by their own player. Um, you know that's that's very hard to avoid. You know you come in really hard and you catch someone's hip, which is obviously an incredibly strong part of the body. There's a good chance you could well be knocked out. Um, but I, I think as well tied into it, and, and probably one of the criticisms I'd have with the HIA protocol is that you can be knocked out on on a Saturday, follow the HIA protocol. 
and pass all the tests throughout the week and then you're available to play the following Saturday. Um, I think, you know, they, they should probably look at if you are knocked out or you fail a HIA, that it's an automatic miss a game for a week. So at least then you've got minimum kind of 12 days to recover. I'm not too sure with, with, with what protocols, um, if they're similar for you. Yeah, like there's obviously amateur and professional protocols in our games. So depending on who I'm playing with, it'd be if I'm in with Ireland, it's a seven day protocol. And if I'm back at my club or with Munster, it's a 21 day protocol because we're amateurs essentially. Um, but like your brain doesn't know the difference between, oh, I'm an amateur and I'm a professional today. You know, you walk into a field, your brain is the same whether you're an amateur or not, you know. So why the rules? I know, obviously, I know you're monitored daily in, in, an, in a professional setup. And I think that's the reason why is that there's more tests, there's more trials, there's more steps of your return to play protocol um, along the way. But like even Ian, if you did bring in that there about missing a game, like I know as a player, I don't want to miss a game. So I'm going to tell the thing with concussion is it's so internal and to me, to the outside, I look fine and I can just say I'm fine. And I don't know if you've any experience with concussions, but I know myself, you know, you think you're fine until you start to run and then you've got headaches and you have to go back a stage again. And then you think you're fine. You go to the gym, you've gone past your running stage and you're like, great, I got through that run and you're, you're on to your gym session and then you're back to square one again. And it's so, it's day by day and it's so slow. But I feel like if you missed a game, the physio's not going to know how you feel it. The doctor's not going to know how you feel. It's really you are the only person who knows how you, how you feel. And bringing in something like that might encourage you to play when you're actually not ready to play. And the protocols are in place, and I think I'm glad they're in place. I'm glad that there is a doctor pitch side who is really, they're looking at them and they're, they're whipping you off the field as quick as you can and taking the decision out of your hands. If they think you need a HIA, you're coming off and you're spending 10 minutes out there doing a HIA regardless whether, you're, whether you want to or not. Um, I think I'm glad the concussion protocols are there. But there's just so much around it. I think the hard thing with concussion is nobody can see it. It's not like a broken leg or a broken arm or anything like that. Yeah, certainly. Like I, I've been lucky throughout my career. I actually haven't had any concussions. Um, you know, <laughs> hopefully a bit of luck and I don't know. <laughs> maybe Staying not getting involved in too rock. much contact. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Maybe it's my small brain not getting rattled around um, or my big head protecting me. Um, but yeah, I, I, as you said there, like it is concussion is a very kind of personal thing. You know, you're, it, you can't see it. It's not a broken bone. It's not a torn muscle. Um, and you've kind of touched on it there. And I've seen it through my career where players are, are trying to come back and they have a few good days and then they do, you know, a more exertive session and, and a faint headache comes up. And if that's, you know, three weeks down the line, three months down the line, it, it, they nearly start thinking, is this headache just something that I'm thinking about? Do, am I actually getting a headache? You know, it's it's a very kind of torturous process. And um, I think the player, there's definitely work to be done on the honesty of, of players with the medics that, you know, have been blessed in, in the last few years. And even in my time in France, you know, the medical teams were very hot on us in Bristol. They were, they were very hot on us um, and, and similar in, in Ulster, but regardless of how good the medical team is, you, you're still going to have nasty concussions. And, you know, even in my time in, in, in Bristol, unfortunately, Will Harrell, who's now retired, um, he had a bad game or sorry, bad, um, head injury and in, when he played Leicester in in the uh, Gallagher Premiership and he unfortunately had a, a stroke induced concussion is now I'm not obviously I'm not a doctor and I'm not exactly sure so I don't want to put my foot in it but the side effects of that were very serious for him you know he his speech was badly affected um memory loss you know to the extent that he 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 could get lost in um a situation that he'd normally be very comfortable in so it's it, that was very tough for for the you know everyone involved and, and seeing what he was going through um but you know it, it's very hard to, to to find direct answers to to you know the get concussion within the game yeah do you th do you see rugby as a dangerous game like we're still playing it you and i are still both playing it like is our game dangerous yeah it, it is it is a dangerous game but we knew what we were getting into. Um, maybe we didn't know all the side effects that, that are there and, and, and that we're seeing now, you know, especially on a week like this. Um, but the biggest thing for, for me is 
looking forward, what improvements can be made? We're, you know, we're still going to have concussions, but can we ensure that the player doesn't return too soon? Can we reduce the amount of concussions that are that we're having? And I think the severity of them as well, you know, it, and I think you'll get that with improved tackle technique, you know, strict refereeing. Um, but no, it is. It's it's a, it's a tough week, I and mean, I'm sure parents are are listening into our show here and reading those articles, and and they might be deciding what sport to to send their son or daughter down and off the back of reading those articles, you might think, oh, maybe let's send them to the local GAA club or the local soccer club. Um, but I think, I think as well, you can forget the, the positives within our game as well. You know, it's fantastic sport, both physically to exert yourself, the camaraderie within the game um, that you might not necessarily get from, from non-contact sports. Yeah. I think there's risks involved in everything you do. You know, it's not just a rugby field. It's, I personally have had more concussions playing Gaelic football than I have had in rugby. So maybe that tells like you if I'm just avoiding rooks or what, but like I honestly have had more, <laughs> more in Gaelic football. So, you know, it's not just about our game. It's about, you know, how you play the game. It's about how the game is, lo- is reft and it's about the laws of the game. But the one good thing I think from this lawsuit is the education of players. Like we now know that okay, I'm not going to return after seven days because I don't feel right. And you know why? Well, it's because my long-term health is much more important than any game that I play on Saturday. And I think that's the one positive here is that there's so many neurological effects of concussion. And, you know, dementia is just one of those, but there's headaches, there's depression, there's mood swings, you know, it's chronic fatigue. These symptoms that people are talking about now and we've seen it quite a lot in the NFL and we've seen a lot of those NFL players quite a high incidence of suicide in there as well due to depression rates because of traumatic brain injury. So if one thing good comes from this, it's that, you know, someone might think twice about stepping back onto the field if they still have concussion symptoms. And I don't think our game, I think our game is dangerous. I think a lot of games come with a risk and I wouldn't urge parents to get turned off rugby as a result of this. I think there's a risk in every game. Certainly, yeah. No, I think it fit the nail on the head there. Absolutely. Well, Ian, it's been a pleasure. That's it for part three. Um, I'd like to thank James for coming on today. It was great to ha- chat to him. Um, cheers to everybody for watching and listening as always. And don't forget, you can continue to get involved in our Facebook group and on our Twitter pages. A huge big thank you to producer Pat, Colm, Dermot, Anthony and everyone that helped in getting this show together. This has been House of Rugby Ireland here on Joe together with Guinness Slongafo. Slaw. House of Rugby Ireland, here on Joe, together with Guinness. Game changed.